the agenda this morning is I'd like to just talk about mindful leadership and mindfulness a little bit, and particularly about maybe some of the challenges that you uniquely need to address as leaders in an academic world. Uh, then uh, I'd like to then teach the meditation and go over, well, what is mindfulness? How does this work? Define some terms, do a session of the meditation together, and then have some discussion, just some general discussion. So that's kind of the, the outline for the morning. Just a few caveats before we get into the discussion. The first one is, um, you know, while I've been fortunate enough to go to college and I have a graduate degree, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and I have had some assignments working with uh, um, senior leaders of universities. My, my background and what I spend my time working in is in business settings, uh, in large corporations, a lot of scientific settings. Uh, so to some degree, I understand the, the, the joys and difficulties of your world, but uh, I, 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 in a certain sense, I really don't. So I will try my best to sort of understand but I know that your challenges are profound, and I don't work in your environment as much as other settings, so I don't want to be too presumptuous about understanding what you all go through. The other caveat is, you know, <clears throat> mindfulness, this is not some form of chauvinism, you know, where like, get on the mindfulness bus, you know, or you're, you're losers or something like that. I mean, I, I have a feeling sometimes mindfulness can be interpreted as some kind of uh, lid-like thing. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Mindfulness is really about uh, acknowledging and unleashing the healthy qualities of who we are as human beings. And in, in that sense, uh, the practice is more about um, respecting who we are than trying to get you to become someone else. Uh, this is not about becoming a better version of who you are. It's about actually uh, experiencing at, at the deepest level who you are already. Uh, so I just wanted to get that chauvinistic issue out of the, out of, out of the way a little bit. If, I, I, sometimes I, as I've been practicing this for a long time and as it becomes mainstream, it does feel a little heavy-handed, you know, that you ought to get on the mindfulness boat, you know what I mean? So with those two um, caveats, let me ask, how many people here, uh, you know, have practiced meditation? Okay. That's, that's about a third of the people here. How many people here do yoga? That's the same time. You know, it's, it's fascinating for me, uh, because I've been practicing meditation since 1976, and uh, when I was on Wall Street in the early 80s, you would never tell people that you meditate, because you'd be relegated to the child's table, you know? It'd be like, hey man, like, is that, you put crystals on your forehead or something? Uh, so it's very ironic to me now, you know, and it's just a short time that I come to many business settings like this one, and, you know, a third of the people, 25% of the people have a meditation practice. And that's gone from it being looked at as woo-woo to, oh yeah, I practice meditation, what's the problem? So it, it's quite fascinating, you know, that I was just down in uh, Brazil. Uh, there's a, a business school down there that's very keen on training CEOs about meditation. And uh, I just brought this one down to show them that this is commonplace now. This is, this is the Sunday business section of the New York Times illustrating what young innovative co companies do, which is meditate. It's like a common situation now. So, in any case. So, I'd like to go over some areas where uh, the practice is, is occurring, uh, and, you know, where it's being applied, and just to give a few observations and then talk about what I believe is a very unique paradox that you guys have to address, a very powerful one. But before we get into the paradox, um, where is this being applied? Where is mindfulness being used and, and why?
Well, in business, of course, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's, I've taught it at Wharton Business School, Harvard Business School has a class in it, you know, it's kind of common now at this point. But it's being, it's being applied in all kinds of settings. I'll just bring one to your attention so you get a sense of how this works. So um, in law firms, mindfulness is being used. Many law firms actually have meditation rooms, right? And uh, there has been some research at the Harvard Law School on this that uh, typically for attorneys, uh, how many lawyers are there? Many lawyers? Okay. So we can't goof on lawyers. We don't want to know. <laughs> uh, but ethically, attorneys are required to maximize the advantage of their clients, often to the unreasonable disadvantage of the opponent. And uh, this creates an atmosphere that is often very aggressive, very challenging. As an HR person, I know what it's like to get a letter where every offense is grossly over-exaggerated and you have to back off that. It's an old kind of thing. Burnout rate is very high for attorneys. Um, what they found is that attorneys that practice mindfulness meditation are, uh, begin to develop uh, sophisticated emotional intelligence skills, or they begin to express them. Like, for example, not being impressed with tantrums, emotional tantrums. A willingness to explore alternatives to problem solving. Uh, a, a lack of anxiety about conflict. So, a lot of attorneys practice mindfulness as a way of preserving the sense of their own well-being in the midst of engaging very often very toxic situations. So, you know, I could go on and on about where the business is using this. I had this one woman who I've been working with who uh, works in a manufacturing setting where she, where uh, engineering, where they engineer parts for planes and they have Japanese Kazan disciplines of self-improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she's introduced mindfulness into the Kazan as a way of training an engineer's mind to be able to attend to the creative process and listen to colleagues more effectively in trying to promote uh, uh, these improvement disciplines in engineering. She actually contends that it's, it's a vital part to the Kazan. Because it's one thing self-improvement, but if you don't know how to listen to one another and openly explore, uh, you actually miss a lot of the innovative disciplines or options. So I could go on and on and on here about where business is increasingly applying this, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention, two examples. Uh, in medical settings, you have one of the finer uh, programs up here at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with uh, Michael Bain in the application of mindfulness to uh, medical settings. Uh, you know, very, I mean, there's so many applications. In fact, how the practice became mainstream was in the management of pain. And uh, it's a long story, but essentially it was a gentleman by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, who was a <laughs> biologist. He was at the University of Massachusetts, and he convinced some folks in the cancer department to uh, apply this practice to people who suffer with uh, enormous pain around chemo when they're getting cancer. And uh, essentially, they, they trained these folks because they couldn't take certain drugs for a variety of reasons. And sure enough, they reported that their pain went down. And by the way, this is all we're talking about. That's it. It's not sophisticated. It's just sitting here. Um, now later, by the way, the, 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 these studies have been done and they in fact now have found that it's not psychosomatic. Literally, the brain experiences less pain by just doing this. But why is that? Because what they found was when you resist pain, you amplify it. And the training is how to touch it. So how to, you'll, you'll see when we do the practice, is it's how to open to your experience rather than pull back. How to touch your world rather than to rehearse it. 
But in medical settings, this ability to train the mind to actually open to one's physical pain, one begins to discover that it's far more workable than maybe you had thought. So in pain management, the discipline is being used. I know in anxiety, my wife is a clinical psychologist. I think there is a gentleman here we were talking about earlier, a psychologist here, who uses this in, is it ACT? What is, what's it? What's ACT, that? ACT 1. What, what does the ACT stand for? Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Right. So this is, again, this is training of the mind to accept and open <laughs> to your distress, rather than trying to necessarily solve it. And you begin to understand that it's a far more workable situation than one would assume. So finally, I mean, we can, I, this, is a, this is a fun one. I, hopefully this is fun for people. This is a fun one. I love telling this one in business settings, particularly with CFOs who are like, oh, what am I doing here? Uh, so they, they did this study, and they've repeated this study uh, uh, several times. They took 100 IT professionals, information tech, uh, technology folks, 100 of them, and they gave them all uh, a shot, uh, a flu shot. Anyone familiar, with, anyone familiar with this study here? This is pretty cool. They gave them all a flu shot. And they trained 50 of them how to do this practice, which we'll do in a moment. And the other 50 they didn't train. So a few months went by where the people who meditated, they meditated, yeah, 20 minutes a day or so for five days before this. And they came back and they took uh, blood samples and found that 100% of the meditators had a higher white blood cell count to resist the flu than 100% of the non-meditators. Produced more, and this, by the way, this is all we did. This is it, this is much, it's very sophisticated, very complicated. That's it, and your white blood cell count goes up. How does that happen? Well, to make, I'm not a scientist, but you know, I'll give you the best as I've read the literature on this, is essentially the part of the brain that regulates the immune system is the same part of the brain that tries to assess a threat. And if there's any IT professionals in the room, uh, they've done studies of this at MIT, no matter what you do as an, MIT, as an IT professional, it's never good enough. It's never, ever good enough. Even if you exceed the expectation, the user goes, oh, I like this. Could it be this? Like a little bunny run across that or something. It's, like, it's never good enough. Can it go faster? Can, I, can you change the color? So there's a sense for IT professionals, a level of pressure they're under, that the experience begins to appear like you're under siege. Requests, demands, deadlines, budgets. So things begin to be perceived as a threat. So the part of the brain that is supposed to be regulating your immune system is in fact on constant alert, trying to figure out, are you, are you trying to screw me? What's going on here? What's happening? And therefore you're not regulating your immune system. When you do this practice, the system goes back to its natural state, your immune system kicks back in, and your white blood cell goes up. It's very simple. It's simple. It is. It's simple. It does it. We'll get into what happens when we do that in a moment. Who finally education? Um, you know, in the, my experience, and I've, I've, again, I do a lot of this in business, so I don't, you know, work in educational settings that much. But I have been invited in, once again, I'm going down to Delaware to work with educators, superintendents, and things like that. The thing that's most striking to me is the use of mindfulness in the classroom or in school settings has been resisted for probably the past 10 years. And frankly, for some good reasons. You know, there's concern about, are you bringing a religion into our school? You know, what, what, what's going on? And I, as a human resources executive, I really appreciate that. I think that's very important. But it's been resisted. Suddenly, that resistance is gone, and this is now moving very rapidly into school systems, uh, where teachers, students, parents, administrators are beginning to do this practice. 
There's all kinds of preliminary research on this that you know, I won't invite you all to go look at, but the one that I love the most is very simple again. I just love this letter. You don't even meditate. It's just, it's just, it, we don't even want to talk about meditation. We're just talking about silence. And if you know anything about high schools, the transition from class to class is intense. I went to an all-boys conservative high school. You know, you weren't, you know, you were like, you know, ties and like the whole thing. I went to my son's school. I, I, I was like, oh my God. What happens between classes is intense. It's like, it's like a giant party. It's intense. And then all of a sudden, you're in a classroom. The managing of that transition is a significant educational challenge. In terms of young people's attention, their willingness to learn, the, the social atmosphere in which they're trying to function. Uh, and what they found is if you begin a class with two minutes of silence and end the class with two minutes of silence, everything's just booked with silence. We're, we're not even training the mind, we'll get into that in a moment about what you're doing when you're sitting here. That attention span doesn't skyrocket, but it has a nice upward curve. Just by remaining silent. So a student in the hallway, uh, you go in the room, first thing you do is no, none of this, none of that, just the tension span goes up. It doesn't hockey stick, it just gradually grows. So these kinds of insights in cultures of schools are growing. The sense of slowing down, silence, that kind of thing. And it's having impact on learning, tension span. It's being used in prisons, etc., etc. But what about higher ed? You know, there's, a, there's all kinds of work being done. I was just mentioning t to our colleague here, who runs the little meditation session, which I guess we'll mark it in a moment, that uh, there are schools like Virginia Tech <coughs> has formed a council down in Virginia with George Mason and Radford around bringing contemplative disciplines into higher ed, et cetera, et cetera. But, so there's probably a lot to be said about this, but I, I'd like to propose that you guys are addressing a very powerful paradox in higher ed. That this practice could be of some help. And the paradox is, is this. As you know, paradoxes have two sides. So I'm the first side, I'm the second. The first is that the situation that we're living in is actually remarkable. This is actually amazing. I mean, literally, what's happening right here in this room this is just actually remarkable. There's a book written by, I always forget his name, but I wrote it down this time. Greg Easterbrook. I love the book. It's called The Progress Paradox. Anybody familiar with The Progress Paradox? I love advertising. Uh, it's a very one-dimensional book, frankly. Uh, but it's brilliant and it's important. And what Greg does in the book is he goes through in excruciating detail and documents that the experience that you and I are having right now in this room, this very second, is better by any measurement, conventional measurement, than the experience that 99.99% of all human beings have ever had. That this is it. This is what humanity has been working toward. That we are wildly endowed. Just wildly endowed. I mean, just this love, this water. This is the most dangerous thing on the planet. It's a very dangerous, it kills tens of thousands of people a year. 
but I get as much as I want. We take showers, everything. It's amazing. But the history of humanity, getting the water that you know is safe is not easy. You know, cotton. You know, just 200 years ago, cotton, that's a big deal. Getting a piece of cotton, taking care of it. You don't have cotton underwear. Cotton, it's very simple. Um, education. Right? I mean, come on, you guys have one of the finest engineering schools and general education in the world. But if I lived in Philadelphia, I not only have Drexel, I got this other thing, what is it called, University of Pennsylvania, that, we got that, we got Temple, we have Swarthmore College. How many more do we need? I mean, <clears throat> just the infrastructure of education is just remarkable. You know, just, I don't know, 100 years ago, you know, just getting into a good grade school was difficult. You know, this, do we all know this one? I got the <laughs> history of human knowledge right here. I can look up anything I want. We could go on and on and on. Hospital, you know, medical. If someone was having a heart attack right now, the hospital would back up to this. Beep, 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 beep. And the most advanced chemistry, the most advanced medical disciplines would be brought here. The hospital would come here, we wouldn't have to go to the hospital. So what Estabro does is he goes through in excruciating detail and documents, uh, statistically as well as historically, the fact that the experience that we're having right now is from a civilized point of view, this is it. This is it. But the other side of the paradox is that despite the fact that we're living this wildly endowed circumstance, just beyond anything that any human being expected, the other side of this paradox is that suicide is the second leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 20 and 24. Suicide. Now I bring that up only because I know that everybody in this room knows that number. You know, one out of one in 12 college students have a written plan to kill themselves. Have written it down. That's according to government findings. This is amazing, right? The depression rate, Americans continue, the depression rate continues to go up and up and up. Anxiety rates continue to go up and up and up. The one that is distressing to me is that one out of five Americans report that they've been demeaned, degraded, personally, in the last 24 hours on the job. So that the workplace is often a very toxic place to go. So, this is, the, this is the circumstances we find ourselves in. We're in a situation where <clears throat> we're so fortunate, yet at the same time, people are increasingly distressed, lost, lonely, afraid. There's a recent book out, Enlightenment Now, by a guy named Pinker. It is first name, I apologize. Yeah, it's last name's Pinker, I want to write it down. Where he uh, goes through all of the data, very optimistically, things are getting really great. A lot of scientific, you know, the uh, poverty rate has gone down significantly in the world. The infant mortality rate has gone down significantly. Homeless rates have gone down significantly in the world from a certain point of view. We should all be cheering up. But nonetheless, 
the level of spiritual, emotional, and psychological distress is on the rise. This is a paradox, one that you folks need to deal with every single day, given the young men and women who come through this institution. Before I move on, does that resonate with you guys? Any observations on that? Because I'll tell you how I handle this in business. I'm getting a lot of not yes. I mean, I would just say it's a paradigm of it's never enough, it's never good enough, it's never on time enough, and not enough. Yeah. And that's just my personal opinion. That the standards are just so great and rapid and pace of things that yeah. sometimes we don't step back and celebrate the beauty of what we do together. Yes. And that there's just such accomplishment and talent that sometimes we need to pause for two minutes and say, well done, Dragons. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think part of the challenge for young people is we're being spoon-fed a false story. You know, it's, you know when you switch digital TVs and the, and the camera just stops for a moment and it's frozen before you get you know what I'm talking about? Like, well, whatever pizza, whatever pizza commercials come on, I go, oh, my God, they switch. And it's happened a couple of times. It switches as the, the, the mom and dad's picking the pizza up and the cheese is coming off and everyone's like this. <laughs> They're like worshiping the pizza. It's like amazing. And the reason why I bring that up is because at a very early age, we're taught that, you know, you need to have extra cheese. You know, because it's not good enough unless you have cheese in the crust now. <laughs> right, there's always, it's, that the experience that you're having is not good enough. It's gotta be some other experience. It's gotta have extra cheese on it. And, and, and this is, I mean, we're being fed this 100%, 24-7 now. As adults, we're busy running around. But if you're a five-year-old, six-year-old, you need to have the next toy. You have the next gadget. The, the gadget I have is not cool enough. The shoes I have is not cool enough. The pizza I have doesn't have enough cheese on it. There has to be some other experience. Because this one's not good enough. But the one we're having is the best that humanity has ever had. And what happens is it translates, and you know, I've been in uh, South Korea lecturing on this topic and speaking with some Buddhist teachers there. The suicide rate for students in South Korea is enormous. And the, the, one of the core issues is shame. That they're very ambitious people. Very, like, you want to perform. But if you don't get into the right school, you've, dis, you've disgraced your family. So the ambition isn't based upon creative enthusiasm. It's based on fear and shame. And what happens with this extra cheese pizza thing is that begins to translate when you get into high school and college. Am I good enough? Do I have enough extra cheese on me? You know, am I good enough? So this paradox about the fact that our world, we build a world that is actually beautiful and beautifully endowed, is in fact sending the opposite message that you're not good enough. That this isn't good enough. This is a very powerful cultural dilemma that uh, you guys really are front, right front and center on here. And the mindfulness, I, I can quite confidently say from my experience that the mindfulness practice, when well understood and well disciplined, uh, is um, 
an avenue for addressing this very skillfully, very quickly, and very directly. When well understood and well practiced. So, as I said earlier, I do this in business settings. I don't do this in academic settings too much. So, I'd like to tell you a few stories about how I bring this into business settings, which could reflect well on, on, on this dilemma here. And how mindfulness can actually inspire this quality of who we are is good and decent. You don't need extra cheese on who you are. So just a few stories, if I may. Some principles of mindful leadership, so to speak, that uh, resonate well with business leaders. So I'll tell a story, if I may. And this, what time does this end, Monica? So I, uh, what, 11. Oh, sorry, I need to get to the minute. Talking about meditation is like standing next to a pool and talking about swimming. It's like, hey, just get in the water here. Where is this? Okay. So I'll just tell a couple of stories. We'll get to the meditation. So I'm very fortunate to be in business settings where I'm invited to meet with executives and talk about business and mindfulness and how to apply it, etc. And on occasion, I run retreats. And at this, this happened maybe eight years ago, six, seven years ago, I forget, somewhere around then. Uh, at the end of a retreat, this executive came up to me and he said, uh, well, I really like this practice. I want to bring this into my company and I want my leaders to be mindful leaders. I said, oh, that's good. I'm happy to help. Him. Give me a call. So he calls me, we arrange this, I go to his office about a month later, staying in his Monday morning, having a cup of coffee. He says, uh, I want you to come in and meet my team. So we go in, opens the door. And by the way, this, this gentleman started his whole business over here in New Jersey. Beautiful business of 450 employees. Really beautiful. It was a financial, it sold the insurance product. You know, this, this man built this. Thing. Beautiful thing. Anyway. Walks me into his thing and sitting around the table or this is the executive team and they're sitting there like this. He comes in and he goes, I went, I went on a retreat with Michael Carroll to study mindful leadership and meditation. I want us all to be mindful leaders. Michael, take it away. So I'm like, oh my God. I'm, gonna have to, I'm here to inflict mindfulness on these poor people. <laughs> So oh, yeah, I started talking, you know, you know what I'm and as I'm talking about mindfulness and leadership, the CFO is sitting there going like this. He's looking at us. Eventually, goes, excuse me, is there a bottom line here? This meditation, mindful leader thing. Is there a bottom line? And I said, oh, that's a good question. I'm so glad you asked that. There is a bottom line. And, you know, what, rather than me telling you what the bottom line is, why don't I just show it to you? And everyone perked up. And I said, yeah. I said, okay, here's the bottom line. So I sat there for a little while, and then I said to them, well, how was that? How was that? And then, what do you think they said? Well, one person said, there is a punchline to this. One person said, 
uh, starting to get very nervous, very nervous. And then another person says, <laughs> it's the first slide, uh, I thought your presentation was starting to unravel. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, what I said to them, as I'm saying to you, is, you know, 60 seconds of psychological space. That's all we're talking about. Psychological space. And what happens is we tend to panic. We tend to panic. This is of great interest in mindful leadership. That we're uneasy. We're uneasy. This uneasiness. So, one of the first principles of this practice and its application to leadership is can we be comfortable in our own skin? Can we be comfortable with who we are? Very simple. It's as simple as that. And it applies to a great degree about the paradox that the young people who come through this institution face. Is this society says, don't be comfortable in your own skin. Become someone else. And by the way, we'll get into this effort in a moment. It's not a bad thing, becoming someone else. But it's not because you're an athlete. Can you be comfortable with who you are? And this notion of being comfortable with who we are is very direct. It's not a concept. This is immediacy of just going, <sighs> So this is a core element of the practice and a core element of leadership. Have you ever, anyone ever worked with a leader who's not comfortable with him or herself? Lots of fun, isn't it? Right? And when you do work with a leader who is comfortable with him or herself and is comfortable with his or her authority, that makes all the difference in the world. Right? So essentially what we're talking about here from the point of view of a mindful leader is confidence. That we have confidence. Not in something, but as who we are. It's confidence. And I tell you, I do a lot of coaching with executives and leaders. And it's the single most important thing that leaders seek is confidence. Because if you're leading, you're engaging something that you have an uncertainty about. It's by definition what happens. That's what it means to lead. So can you be confident in the midst of uncertainty? Has everyone noticed the whole thing's uncertain? Anyone not notice that the entire thing is uncertain? Thank you. Can we be confident in this situation? Well, you know, science is uh, investigating this anxiety, this uh, uneasiness. <coughs> Very interestingly, I'm, I'm trained in the Tibetan lineage. And they are very, this the, the kind of work that they've been doing for centuries really analyzes and gets very, very careful with these kinds of dynamics. And they actually have a name for this particular style of anxiety, which they call Tumuk, yeah, which is, a, it's not anxiety about anything, it's kind of a general bewilderment, which is like, it's, not, it's kind of, this is not Tibetan, but it's basically translated as, what the hell is going on around here? What is that? Is this, is this okay? It's like a doubt about the experience that creates this uneasiness. In any case, science is really getting into this, investigating this at, from all different levels. Uh, and uh, there's one study, which some of you may be familiar with, by a guy named Killingsworth. Anybody familiar with Killingsworth's work at Harvard? In the Wandering Mind? It's a statistic that's used quite a lot at this point. But essentially what Killingsworth's done, doing, and you all may be familiar with a lot of the 
social research disciplines now actually studies human behavior as it occurs rather than in retrospect. That he uses so these phones and tools to try to analyze what are human beings doing as they're doing it. It's pretty cool stuff. In any case, one of his findings is that on average, human beings spend 47% of our time thinking about something other than what we're doing. Right? Everyone, anyone not notice that? Okay. Now, there's a range of situations that gets us to that number, right? If you're hugging your young child, you're probably 100% there. If you're sitting in traffic, you're probably 100% somewhere else, right? and everything in between. Right? And it averages out 50-50, basically. 50% of the time we're thinking about something other than what we're doing, 50% we're actually having an experience. But here's where the dime drops. That metaphor doesn't work in Brazil, by the way, when I say it. And this is where the dime drops. Everybody in the room goes, dime? What's he doing, throwing dimes? This is where the point is made. The 50% of the time when we're thinking about something other than what we're doing, 80% of that time, what we're thinking about is more distressing than the actual experience we're having. We're actually authoring the very distress we're seeking to avoid. That the experience we're actually having is far less distressing than we think because we're making it up. In the tradition of mindful leadership, this issue is vital. Because if we're going to lead others, we first have to stop misleading ourselves. And uh, just came from a conference out west with a professor from uh, Buckers School of Management who was doing some studies on this. Jeremy Hunter he and I are colleagues. We talked about this. <clears throat> and he, he's doing research on the application of mindfulness to leadership. And one of the key areas that he's working in is how leaders can de-bias their point of view. You know, it's very simple. I really like you. You're a very pleasant person. Good friends. I like hanging out with you. This is great. You? I don't like you. I don't like you. It's not like you. And everyone knows, right? So that has nothing to do with you. I'm living in a version of my experience rather than the actual experience that I'm having. And the debiasing of this perspective is vital for, for leaders because you have to know what you're dealing with and make decisions. But from the point of view of the paradox that we're talking about, is all too often we're living in our version of the world rather than the world itself. And the version that we're living in is actually authoring the distress we're seeking to avoid. Now, psychologists have known this. I guess Freud called it projection. Uh, but in the practice, which we're just about to do, you begin to actually distinguish between your version and reality. <laughs> you might notice on TV that we're trained to actually believe that our opinions are real. Uh, but distinguishing that, you know, we would go, well, I'm sure I can distinguish. Well, not so sure. Not so sure. But the practice actually makes it very sure, very clear. The distinction between a thought and an experience is clear. And that, in and of itself, is very powerful in terms of the possibility of not authoring our own confusion. So with that said, <clears throat> uh, 
we'll get into the meditation, but in order to do that, I just want to bring you, your attention to one more principle, and then we'll do the practice for a short period. In order to understand this practice, and by the way, I'm very conservatively trained. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll do a little more, just let me define some terms. So that, you know, we're in an academic setting, so I get to be a little academic. In business settings, I wouldn't do this. Anyways, there's two types of meditation. We're talking everything east from Persia east. There's two types of meditation. Form-based meditation and formless meditation. Form-based meditation uses a specific technique in order to achieve a specific outcome. There are many techniques, depending upon the tradition. You can use visualizations, close your eyes and visualize something. You can use mantras, where you repeat a word over and over again. You can use, you can, uh, there are body meditations like Qigong. Uh, that, you do that in order to raise a sense of vitality and physical health. There are literally thousands of form-based meditations that are designed to bring about a specific result. You may be familiar if you know Pema Chodron's work, uh, you do Tong Lin to generate loving kindness. So, there's an entire body of meditations called form based meditations. The other type of meditation is called formless meditation. Formless meditation uses little or no technique at all and doesn't seek to achieve anything at all. I love saying that in business settings. This is about achieving nothing. What they call the wisdom of achieving nothing. So again, formless meditation uses little or no technique at all and does not seek to achieve anything. The traditions that do that, you know, that have that, or like Zen, you might be familiar with Zen. Uh, in my tradition, it's referred to as Mahamudra or Aati. Uh, you have uh, strains of this in Confucian and Taoist disciplines. But again, formless meditation is no technique, very little, not trying to achieve anything. Mindfulness awareness meditation, which is very common now or mainstream, comes from the formless tradition. Nowadays, everybody's putting all kinds of techniques into it. The original intention is, is no technique. This is, this is the technique. What's that? That's no technique. Well, what, what are we up to here if we're not trying to achieve anything? The effort that we're applying in this form of practice is different than achieving. And achieving is great. We have a beautiful university here. Young people come and they, they work very hard and they achieve. They become someone more accomplished become an MD or a PhD and it's helpful. So <clears throat> we're not saying that that form of effort is, is a problem. This is a different form of effort. And this effort is, is not about achieving anything. It's becoming utterly familiar with your experience. It's not about a, accomplishing something or, or becoming a better version of who you are. It's about experiencing exactly who you are, where you are, completely. This effort of uh, being familiar with your experience has grown flabby in the West. Uh, we're always trying to get somewhere fast, you know? How many times? Even when you're waiting in line at Starbucks, it's like, I always laugh at myself when I get in line at Starbucks. And there's always someone, two or three people in front of me who have to design the coffee. You know, and they're like, hey, you know, I, I think I'll have two, two espresso decaf. Decaf espresso. Why? And they say, a little skim milk. No, make that 2% milk. You know, it's just like, 
I love it. It's hilarious. Because I want to get somewhere. I want to get there fast. Rather than, I'm just sitting in love. It's like, I'm just sitting by. It's normal. So there's this, this, it's grown flabby, this ability to just be who we are, where we are completely. And this practice of mindfulness is a, sort of like going to a spiritual gym where we do spiritual push-ups to actually uh, become familiar with this effort of just being there. Be simple. Being comfortable. Be simple. By the way, it's a very boring, very boring practice. You know, a lot of people come to meditation for the first time and I want to meditate. I get my stress down. Let's go. Meditation to be a great meditation weekend. It's fantastic. I get up. Everyone's excited. We get there. We get in the room. And everyone's like, "Okay, when is this going to end?" How long do I have to sit here? That's right. It's very boring. So I'll go. Let's do some meditation. Thank you for. We'll do the meditation now. These chairs get a B minus for meditation. That's not bad. A lot of them get D's. You know, I'm in corporate rooms where they're on rollers, and they're all spongy and stuff. Uh, the, the reason, the, the good news about these is they're solid, which is great. The, the bad news is they incline back. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna sit up you, as if you don't have a back on the chair, okay? So you're not going to be leaning back. Normally, you'd like to have your feet flat on the ground. But more important than having your feet flat on the ground is your knee needs to be below the crease of your waist. Because if your knee is up higher than the crease of your waist, you have to hold your back up. So if you're doing this practice, whether on a cushion on the ground or in a chair, you're going to want to make sure that the knee is, is below the crease of your waist. In this case, I'm in that situation. I just cross my legs a little bit. Normally, you'd like to have your feet flat on the ground so that you want to have the proper height of the chair. But in this case, if your knees are a little too high, just keep your... And you have to extend down like this because it's easy to sit up straight. It's very simple. The, normally we have a little crease in, in our neck here, when we're looking out. And the way to work with the crease is to simply tuck your chin in, not like this, just like straight. Hands are placed very simply. Mouth is loose, slightly open. And in this style, the eyes are open. And the quality of the gaze is a soft gaze. We're not focusing on anything in particular. It's just a gentle clarity, maybe two, three feet out, down. Just soft gaze. So we're just sitting here like this. We'll try this for a moment. Now, as you're sitting here, you'll notice, basically, there's two things going on. The first is an unmistakable immediacy as your senses. Very simple, very vivid, very direct, unmistakable. You can hear the sounds of the air conditioner, you can see the colors, you can feel your hands on your legs, so very 
first thing you know is very direct, very simple. You're sitting in a room as your senses. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that you're talking to yourself. There's a commentary. Commentary could be about anything. It could be gently meandering. It could be trying to figure out what, oh, i got to get to a meeting. It, whatever. We, we're all very familiar with this. Now, there's no problem about these two experiences. In fact, it's exactly what we work with in the practice. And the way we work with it in this practice is, as you're sitting here in this posture, sitting here in the room, as soon as you notice that you're thinking, as soon as you notice it, you deliberately recognize that you're thinking by saying to yourself, silently thinking, and you bring your attention to your breathing. And you, we attend to our breathing is not really a mental exercise as much as it is a bodily attending. You may feel the movement of your chest or your belly as you're breathing. You may actually hear ever so slightly your breathing. Or feel it on, on your lips or your nostrils. At some point, you notice that you're thinking. As soon as you notice you're thinking, you label it thinking and bring your attention back to your breathing as you're sitting here in the room. So we'll try this for a short period and we'll begin and end the session with the ring of the bell.
So do you have any <clears throat> questions about that instruction or observations about your experience? Notice your thinking. Label it thinking, and bring your attention to your breathing. Sure. You will notice, and this is why I think it's very powerful in therapy, is that as soon as you put your attention on the thought, what happens? No. As soon as you put your attention on the thought, it disappears. It stops. Well, hold on a second, hold on a second. You, you made it, you went, hmm. Ted. I don't do that. I tend to explore it. No, there's a gap just before you go back to explore it. Okay. As soon as you put your attention on the thought, it stops. You'll pick it up right again. Mm -hmm. That gap is not a minor detail. All you need to do is place your attention on the thought, and it's gone. If you escort your attention and stabilize your attention on your breathing, you begin to be able to actually have an experience that's not filtered through a thought, but that takes some time. But it's very important to notice that as soon as you go to label a thought, it's gone. Not a minor detail. Yes? You said everything. Oh. Right. Yeah, it, 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 we, we think that, you know, that we're trying to quiet the mind. It's one of the misconceptions about this practice. Is that, oh, we're trying to quiet the mind, the, the movement of the mind. You'll never quiet the mind. It moves. It's a very creative element of who we are. Sometimes it's very meandering, sometimes it's speedy, panicky. What we're working with is what is noticing the display of the mind. You don't typically distinguish that. And if you actually become familiar with what is noticing, it is already inherently still. But we don't, we're unaware of that. Yes? The more that you do it, you can actually anticipate your thoughts coming going for a while. There are times when you can almost anticipate a thought coming in before it even comes, and you can almost evacuate it before it even gets into your brain. Yeah, there's different styles. So there's what's called close placement. I'm getting somewhat technical, but why not? I'm getting old, I get to do what I want now. There's, there's what's called close placement, right? So in Zen, right? you pull it. You put your attention on the two thumbs as if you're holding a piece of paper. Bring your attention in closer. And the, the level of precision is so precise that even as the thought is about to arrive, it's clipped. Very precise. It's called close placement, certain style. This is a much, this style that I just communicated here is much uh, more gentle spacious approach, not that either is right or wrong, by the way. It's kind of letting thoughts, uh, the metaphor is used is you let, like a cow. You want to calm a cow down, or a bull that's angry, you let it run around, eventually it just falls asleep. That's a style, it's more spacious. But you're right, if you do a more close placement, you can clip it. Right. Any other, yes? Yes, again, I, we were discussing this earlier. Right? You know, I'm very conservative. The eyes closed is a technique. Eventually, you're going to need to drop that technique if you want to bring this practice to its fullest measure. 
and the actual dropping of closed, of eye, the closed eyes is difficult if you do this continuously that way. You'll notice when you have your eyes closed that the attention drops to the chest and there's kind of a cozy kind of situation going on. This style permits no place to hide at all whatsoever. You're sitting in the room, period, end of story. And it's actually designed as a little bit of a pressure cooker on the confused mind. Uh, it also, by the way, when it has a, when you escort your attention from a thought to, a, to the breath, you have to let go and open. Very subtle spiritual muscle. If your eyes are closed, you don't need to open. The opening is actually the seat of compassion because you're willing to open to your world. When your eyes are closed, you're willing to take care of yourself, which is a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but in this case, you're open to your world. that you've been trained in and one that you wish to explore. On the other hand, from this point of view, <coughs> what do you mean more comfortable than what? Why are you seeking to have a more comfortable experience other than the one you're having? I always, I always strive for comfort. <laughs> That's right. There you go. This practice is not striving for comfort. It's not trying to have a preferred experience. We're actually trying to be utterly familiar with the actual experience that we're having, which, by the way, may be a little disconcerting because my mind's going, oh my God, I hate this, come here, blah, blah, blah. okay. Let's, let's get to know that. There's plenty of ways that we can anesthetize ourselves from that, have a beer, watch television, have an extra cheese on your pizza, blah, blah, blah. But here, we want to actually touch that distress a little bit. Yeah. Well, in the beginning of the practice, if, if, are you new to the practice? Yeah. Yeah. So, particularly in the beginning, this is not an unusual experience. Right? Now, why is that? Obviously, you could have been out late at night partying, and that's fine. But, really, typically what this is about is... Normally, the way we conduct ourselves in everyday life is we don't distinguish who we are from the thoughts that we're having. When we're sitting here going, oh, I gotta work, I gotta work these tests, these kids, I don't want to do, oh my God, you know, my, my husband's leaving me, whatever. We, that's who we are, right? I mean, in the morning, it's my toothbrush, blah, 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 right? When you do this practice, for possibly particularly in the beginning, for the very first time, you begin to notice that that's not who you are. Those are just thoughts. And when you distinguish yourself from them and you touch it, you realize, oh my God, there is so much energy that I am using inside here, rehearsing my life rather than living it, that the experience of that is exhausting. It's the most honest relationship with the speed of the mind. So it's not unusual, it's not a bad thing, but it's like, wow, I am exhausted. This is exhausting, sitting here. No, this is what we're doing. And as soon as we sit here, we go, oh my God, I'm exhausted. There are techniques to work with that. You come back, drop the technique, you know, don't label, you come back to your body. Normally we do walking meditation to keep the thing fresh. <clears throat> but the kind of existential observation is, is exhausting. The speed of the mind is exhausting. Lots of energy is being hijacked. Okay. Just a couple more. Are there any others before we end? One last one. Yes, my friend. I'm curious just because with regards to mindfulness, I haven't heard you mention it yet. But this idea of non-judgment. You usually that's one of the things that I think educators on mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I think 
why I didn't use the word yeah, not judgment. Yeah, one of those buzzwords of mine is not judgment. Yeah, why did I say not judgment? I did say debiasing. <laughs> Um, but I'll make the point is that this effort is, is about a direct, unmitigated experience of exactly what's going on. And by definition, that effort is an unbiased experience. That we're not judging or preferring one over the other. It's a judging issue. I prefer a more comfortable technique. Why do you prefer another experience over the one you're having? Why are you biasing toward one or the other? So it's implicit in the situation, in the way I'm giving the instruction. However, this is an important issue. Part of this practice, the very important part of this practice, is what is called Maitri, or loving kindness. Now, in, in the West, when we say that, we're like, you know, it's particularly in business settings. Now, what you'll find is when you're, as a non-judgmental practice, you begin to actually explore who you are without judging them. You know, okay, I have a big butt. Who cares? Big butt. Yeah, I like, you know, it, 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 it's not like, oh, I'd rather have a skinny butt. I'd rather be a better version of who I am you actually begin to explore exactly who you are. And that is an expression of kindness. You have to actually stop hitting yourself with a rubber hose. You know, I don't like my big butt, I don't like my gray hair, I don't like having warts, I'm talking to myself right now. I'm getting old, it's really a pain in the butt, does everyone know that? Uh, but it's okay. And that, there's a kindness there, there's a gentleness that occurs very naturally from the practice. And this gentleness is very wise. It isn't soft or gooey. It's very wise. And it, it does come out of this non-judgmental approach to just simply having the experience that we're having. So I want to thank you for your attention. Maybe you could market these other wonderful presentations. Yes. Yes, I think we will. This is it. Because there's other cool stuff going on around. Right, so if you're going back to wherever it is you are, Drexel, um, and want to tell everybody about our Mindfulness Day, we have the um, introduction, it doesn't have the time on it. Our next one, Monica, starts at noon. Noon to one, and then there's two to three, and three to four. Um, four to five. Four to five. So there's stuff going on all day in this space. Michael will be here all day. There will be a chance to interact informally after the meeting session um, if you're interested in purchasing a book or having a chance to Are there other speakers as well? Um, like, yeah. yeah. And there's also, maybe you can tell people about your meditation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> there's really cool human beings involved in cool stuff. <laughs> So this is Haji Shreffler. She uh, runs the weekly meditation group, which is now in its almost six almost years. years. And Jan yeah. will let her explain the structure. So we meet um, every Thursday from 12 to 1 in the Inner Food Sanctuary in the James E. Mark Intercultural Center up on um, 32nd and Arch Street. It's a drop-in session. It's open to our entire community, students, faculty, staff. And it's an opportunity to come together to practice mindfulness um, it, there is definitely energy being with other people, um, I feel. So if you have a practice, if you don't have a practice, please join us. Um, it's a place to continue this and um, do that. We will be meeting tomorrow, 12.30 to 1 o'clock. Great. And, and, if, and if you want more information about that, if you want to be on the email list, you can contact me or Haji. Occasionally, Haji does have other things to do and can't be there, but it's basically every Thursday at 12.30. So the DMG also sponsors a quarterly live person <coughs> so you can interact with an actual human around meditation. So we have an introduction to mindfulness-based stress reduction with Michael's friend and colleague, Alexander DeVaron. So he'll be coming back as a follow-up. He'll introduce some very basic techniques to us about mindfulness. That's on the 23rd. He's a professor from Temple, so mm -hmm. he'll get 
college setting as well. More academia. That's right. <laughs> So that is open to faculty and staff. You can register in Career Pathway. There's also a live webcast. We also have Mike Gottlieb. Do you want to come on up? <laughs> he's also he's here from our Counseling Center. He's doing a session for faculty and staff about mindfulness of emotions. And so he'll be introducing some techniques as well. It's in June. And I'll let you talk about student opportunities for mindfulness as well. Yeah, so um, I'll be doing for faculty and staff. I think some of you have seen familiar faces who attended the previous talk on psychological flexibility, so we'll be building on that and talking more specifically about emotions. And then for students, a lot of the workshops and groups that we host at the Counseling Center are based on mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, the main one is called Act One. We have a self-compassion workshop as well, and we have a mindful eating workshop. So if you have any students that are interested, my email is on the blue flyer. And it's open to all students, the workshops. They don't necessarily have to be clients of the Counseling Center. I think that's an important distinction to make. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Hey, and if you're on the internet right now, this is available on the website for you to download the workshop. So you can go to Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for your time.